Everyone who played sports as a kid experienced it. There's this kid on your team, about yay high, built like a twig, might wear glasses that look something like this, and most importantly, not a shred of athletic ability in their frail little body. A Millhouse type character, if you will. But, against all odds, they consistently get more playtime than the rest of the team. As a kid, maybe you don't think much of it. Maybe you question it with every fiber of your being. Then one day, it hits you. That kid is the coach's son. To those of you thinking that I was probably that kid, I'll have you know that in my age 6 season, I led the league in B-War, F-War, infield tantrums, and accidents in the batter's box. I'm Jack of All Baseball, and I'm here to show you some MLB seasons that'll make you think, why is this guy still getting at bats? Is this dude the coach's son? Introducing your coach's son season candidates. Batting leadoff, 2018 Chris Davis. In 2018, Davis put up an impressive negative 3.3 baseball reference war. How did he manage to do this? Well, despite his poor performance, he was still given 522 plate appearances. That's tied for second least B war in a season with at least 500 plate appearances all time. But, before we get into the details of this season, let's do some quick detective work to see if Chris might have been the coach's son. Davis played for the Baltimore Orioles in 2018. The coach that year? None other than the legend himself, Buck Showalter. Here they are side by side. Let's see how natural it looks when we do a face swap. Hmm, so on this side, we have Dr. Phil's long lost brother. And on the other side, we have an actor from the original Planet of the Apes movies. Well, these pictures are just about the furthest thing from natural, so let's dig a little deeper into Chris Davis's 2018 season. This season wasn't, or at least shouldn't have been, a major surprise to the club. Chris's numbers had been dwindling in the years prior, and although a drop of this magnitude was probably not expected, another decrease in production certainly followed the recent trend. Between 2015 and 2018, he saw yearly decreases in batting average, slugging, OPS, and OPS+. Overall, Davis's numbers reflect a pretty stereotypical power hitter, with home runs and strikeouts among the highest in the league. In seasons like this, it's often not a bad guess to assume a nagging injury is the cause of the sharp decline in production. but. This isn't likely the case as a Chicago Tribune article from the end of the 2018 season reported. Other articles on the topic suggested that Davis was just another victim of the shift. But I find this hard to believe as the sole reason for his struggles. His baseball savant page shows that yeah, he was shifted on in a little over 90% of his plate appearances. But this wasn't a change that just happened in 2018. Davis was shifted on just as much in the two seasons prior. So what was going wrong? There's no doubt that the mental strain of poor performance over this extended period of time played a role, but there might be more to it. A Sports Illustrated article from the end of the season quoted Jim Palmer weighing in on Davis's struggles, stating, you've got to make some adjustments, I don't see anything. And that's where the problem seems to have been. Pitchers and fielders had adjusted to Davis, but he never answered back. And to top it all off, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, the end of the 2018 season accounted for the start of Davis's infamous 54 at bat hitless streak, which carried into 2019. So, why did Chris Davis continue getting at bats? We already saw from our detective work earlier that he definitely isn't the coach's son. Well, at the end of the 2015 season, the Baltimore Orioles had signed him to a 7-year, $161 million contract, the most lucrative deal the franchise had ever seen. The Orioles had made an impulse purchase. And like most impulse purchases, a little while later the Orioles said, Hey, I paid a lot of money for that and I intend on using it no matter how bad it looks. Moving on to our next candidate we have 2021 Hunter Dozier. 
In his 2021 season, he managed to accumulate negative 2.5 baseball reference war over the span of 543 plate appearances. Again, before we take a closer look at this season, let's do some of our detective work and see if Hunter Dozier might have been the coach's son. Dozier played for the Kansas City Royals in 2021 and was managed by Mike Matheny. Here's Dozier and Matheny side by side. Now, let's do another face swap so we can judge how natural they look. Here we go. All right, so this time we've arrived at the Value Village version of Mark McGuire and a young Amish man. Not quite as disturbing as last time, but definitely not natural by any means. So let's take a closer look at Hunter Dozier's 2021 season. The years leading up to 2021 are a mixed bag in terms of value. He had a pretty rough 2018, but followed it up with the best season of his career so far in 2019, and then had an admirable 2020 effort to complement it. Then, in 2021, Dozier's numbers dove headfirst off of a cliff. If it wasn't for his 2018 season, he would have posted career lows in most of the typical offensive stats. Check out the similarities between 2018 and 2021. The numbers are nearly identical. The only reason he was able to accumulate less war in 2021 is because he was given more plate appearances to do it. If he was given the same opportunity in 2018, it probably would have been even worse. Nagging injuries can't be blamed for this entire season, but they might be to blame for the first few weeks at least. On opening day, he sustained a minor thumb injury that kept him out of the lineup for three games. Dozier later stated that, it was bugging me for a couple weeks, and I didn't do a good job of dealing with it. The only other stretch where he missed more than one game in a row was after a May 14th collision between himself and Jose Abreu on an infield pop-up. Dozier missed 11 games and was back in the lineup on May 28th. Looking at his offensive production month to month, it looks like 2021 was a complete roller coaster with his OPS wavering back and forth for the entire year. Luckily, he ended on a really good note. So, why was he still getting at bats despite his poor performance? There are a few things that jump out right away. Defensive versatility is highly valued among teams due to the flexibility it grants when making the lineup, and Dozier was among the most versatile on defense. Throughout the season, he fielded first base, third base, right field, and left field. It's pretty impressive. The only problem is that fielding the position is very different from being good at it. Dozier has still yet to post a defensive war above zero over a full season. The other reason he was probably still getting at bats, maybe unsurprisingly, happens to do with the contract Dozier was signed to. 2021 was the first season of a four-year, $25 million contract that breaks down like this. It looks like the Royals were banking on Dozier being able to replicate his 2019 season. Unfortunately, he chose to replicate 2018 instead. Moving on to our final candidate, we have 2012 Jeff Francoeur. In 2012, Francoeur put together a season where he finished with negative 2.2 baseball reference war over the course of 603 plate appearances. We're going to take one last shot at using our foolproof detective method to determine whether or not Jeff was the coach's son, which might explain why he continued getting at bats that year. In 2012, Francoeur played for the Kansas City Royals. The manager of the Royals that year? Ned Yost. Here are Francoeur and Yost side by side. And after a quick face swap, here's what we're working with. Oh my god, we might actually be on to something this time. These look like real people. Especially over here, I mean, this just looks like your typical suburban dad. He wears New Balance shoes and appreciates a good lawn. Alright, well, I don't think we can count out the coach's son theory this time. But nonetheless, let's take a closer look at Jeff Francoeur's 2012 season. Francoeur was coming into 2012 with his head held high. The previous season was his first with the Royals organization, and also happened to be the second best of his career by B-War. 
accumulating 3.2 over 153 games. In saying that, it was probably an unwelcome surprise for the team and Frank Kaur when his numbers took a U-turn in 2012. He started off the year cold in March and April, then picked things back up in May, but quickly crashed back down to earth for June, July, and August. Once again, it's not likely that injuries played a role in this season. Francoeur played 148 games and only missed a maximum of three games in a row on a couple of occasions. Part of his struggles can be attributed to his free-swinging mentality in the box and failure to be more selective with pitches. These qualities were criticized throughout his career and are made pretty evident through his low on-base totals in the bulk of his seasons. We can also see from fan graphs that his swing rate on pitches outside of the zone ranked 4th in the league in 2012 among qualified hitters, and his on-base percentage tied for 5th lowest. So I'll ask the same question I did with the other two players. Why was Frank Kaur still getting at bats? He didn't possess the same defensive versatility that Dozier did. He spent the entire year in right field and didn't put up very good numbers at that. His solid 2011 season probably played a part, not to mention the two-year $13.5 million contract he signed after it. But there's another aspect of Jeff Francoeur that we haven't talked about yet. Since Francoeur entered the league with the Braves in 2005, he was one of the most likable players in the league. It doesn't take much effort to find countless stories that highlight his good character. An ESPN article from 2012 highlights a few of these stating that he had 20 personal pizzas delivered to a small but animated group of Oakland Athletics fans while playing at the Coliseum. It also mentions that the year prior, Frank Corr wrapped a baseball in a $100 bill and tossed it into the outfield crowd, urging fans to buy bacon and beer with it. So, Jeff Frank Corr, a coach's son in 2012? Maybe. But a damn good dude? No doubt about it. All in all, these players had some pretty rough seasons, but even though I joke about them, they've all had good years as well. It's easy to have a bad year when you're up against all the other best players in the world, whether it be from injury, mental fatigue, or just your average slump. These guys survived seasons like this and continued getting at bats because they showed potential in previous years and their teams wanted to get them back to their former selves. If you made it this far, Thanks for watching, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Jack of All Baseball, and I'll see you next time.